you know, we use language for explaining things, for saying simple things. Obviously, there's the art in language of speaking in between the, you know, the words, you know, the subtext. But with music, it's all subtext. Yeah. And could it be that they that these other species are speaking in a subtextual way as well? That we're just not we're looking for it to be very functional, and it isn't. Welcome everybody I'm, uh, to the Sea Has Many Voices. I'm Greg Stone, John Powell, and Simone Bauman Pickering, who's a researcher and teacher at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and we're talking about sound in the ocean. I'd like to ask you in this segment about communication. What's the thinking along these lines, or the speculation, or the guessing that's going on now? Do dolphins talk to each other? So they do to some degree, and we have some knowledge of it, and the closest that we got to, I guess, is uh, that some dolphins have what's called signature whistles. It's essentially that Joe always does this whistle and Jack does another, and that's their signature. And they can, at times, imitate the other's signature whistle, so Joe can call Jack. And, and, and so that's kind of the, the study in terms of the whistling that people have done. The problem is that you can only study that if, you're, if you really can identify individuals and if it's a few individuals and you know them in and out and you stick with them and, and, and you, you know, learn their behaviors. And that is a very unusual circumstance. Mm -hmm. Because um, some species are only a few animals that live together in a group, but others are hundreds and hundreds of animals that, that move around together. And so understanding how they interact with communicating with each other is, so is not as not as basically we haven't made any progress in this area. Not really, no. <laughs> but I mean, what we do know, for example, is that they eavesdrop, that they listen in to echolocation of another. Oh, so as they swim along, um, it doesn't make sense for two that swim right next to each other to both emitting echolocation clicks, though they can listen in to the echolocation oh, click that the neighbor does. So they can interpret somebody else's clicks? Correct, oh. yeah. And so if they can interpret you know, the echolocation clicks, I'm sure that there's other information contained in that than just here's an echo of a fish. Because you know, we experience the world with our eyes, with our nose, with our ears, and these animals predominantly perceive their world with their ears. Correct. That's their kind of the way they sense things. And I'll tell you a little anecdote. When I was studying my dolphins, it was Hector's dolphins in New Zealand, during the period of my 10-year study, this swim with program was introduced, which was a really nice experiment for me to see the difference in the population of dolphins once they were exposed to commercial activity five times a day. And they became habituated to boats, and I started to see more boat strikes. They just it changed everything. But one thing we noticed is that whenever there was a pregnant woman in the swim with tourism group, the dolphins were just like all over her. They just like were fascinated by the 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 baby, and they would like you could see them, you know, scanning her because it's like a sonogram. You know, everybody's seen a sonogram of the baby at the hospital. Well, the dolphin has that times 100 in terms of resolution. In fact, they were so good at it that this one woman, they behaved as if she was pregnant. And we asked her, she wasn't showing. And she said, are you pregnant? And she said, no. So well, we've never seen them get this interested in a woman that wasn't pregnant. Well, she called us up the next week and said she actually was, like just a, like a few days after conception. So they could actually detect that very early stage. So what I'm getting at here is that in terms of communication, imagine if... John, you could look at me and you could see, you know, the stress levels in my muscles. You could see if I have a tumor somewhere. You could see what I, what I last ate, what my last meal was. That's the kind of resolution these animals have. So you, it really makes you th have to rejigger your idea of communication. But a dolphin doesn't know the physiology of a human. Was it just simply that they had two hearts? Well, that's, that's what, a good question. That's what was interesting to them. It's the only other kind of rhythmic pump we have. It's the only rhythm we are constantly producing for our whole lives. I guess if a human walks into the water and they suddenly hear, oh, the rhythm, 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 two rhythms, two rhythms. Why have they got two rhythms? What's going on with their rhythms? That's interesting. 
for them? You know, you've just asked the very good fundamental question that I'm sure no one has an answer to. Does the dolphin have the ability to recognize a related taxa, like that we're, mam we're both mammals, and they're able to, like, say, oh, I because obviously they can see pregnant dolphins, right? That's another thing in terms of communication. You can swim around and you can say, oh, she's pregnant, not interested in her, you know, <laughs> find somebody else. Um, you get all this information. My guess, John, would be that they are intelligent enough to recognize that it's another animal and they reproduce like we dolphins reproduce. And I can see this mm -hmm. going on over there. And it's, it's quite fascinating to me. I think they can probably make that leap. Um, I fundamentally do not think dolphins are as smart in the way dolphin lovers like to think they're smart. There's a group of dolphin enthusiasts that, you know, think that maybe they're out there writing poetry or novels <laughs> or, and, and I don't think that. I think they're really good at signal processing and their whole life is about socializing. Now, you talked about a few minutes ago, dolphins living in herds of like a hundred, right? And, and I've, you know, I've been with them and they, their whole life is swimming together, looking at each other. There's a lot of sexual foreplay going on all the time in these groups. They're scanning each other for their physiological state. They, you know, there's, so the communication is a completely different thing. Instead of having to start the day off with, hi, how are you, Simone? I can just go D -d 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 -d, and I can get a complete read on your physical state your stress level, you know, all that kind of information. So it turns into a, more of a gestalt kind of communication. I mean, I think it, we're, we're in new ground here. I mean, this isn't anything that anybody really knows about, so it's fine to speculate. But I did read in one of your pieces something about, and you kind of alluded to it with, this, with them eavesdropping on another echolocating dolphin, that if you could get an echolocation image in your dolphin brain of a fish, is it possible to transmit that? Mm. I think that's what I read about. It was, it was the idea that maybe these animals can click an image to another animal. I mean, they're definitely capable of shaping their emissions to certain circumstances. And, and we, we were talking about that a little bit offline earlier, that our capabilities in parameterizing, if you will, sound is is quite limited and maybe we have we may not have certain brain capacities the way dolphins have to do that kind of signal processing and if we do the signal processing on the computer i think we're we're not at the level where we need to be in terms of quantifying subtle differences that may be just really relevant or we don't look at them just in the mm. right way mm. and so mm. There could be a whole different um, suite of information transported in those acoustics <clears throat> that we that we're just not capable in putting our finger on them. Yeah, they live their life and they have been optimizing their their brain cap capabilities on sound, and and so they must have some extra screws in there to <laughs> tweak that. But that does ask the question for me: is like. I've spent my whole life trying to figure out why music, right. because music is a language, yeah. and it just doesn't say anything that we normally would say with language. It says a whole bunch of other things, and it's different to every single person, and I've been puzzling over this forever. If we come from the same sort of biological brain function, to be able to, maybe we're an extension of that ability to be able to understand sound, and ours has just leapt over the functionality of it because we develop language, mm. and we've used the functionality that they're using but for music, because if, 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 I'm, if I'm in any way be able to understand music, for me it's kind of the ultimate ability of humans to understand something in a way that, is, um, that has no function. It has absolutely no function to us. At all, and I can't. I can't find any function of musical well, understanding. I mean, you can you can go back and you look at birds and, and sex, and you know, be able to project sound, you know, sound further than vision, and attract mates, and there's all sort of those kind of things. There's the rhythms of the hearts and stuff. But now we're at a point in humanity where we're able to listen to highly complex 
sounds and they're temporal. And in, in other words, they start in one place and go to another. Why, why do we enjoy the arc of yeah. a piece of music and where is it going? And the only thing I've ever found is that I, music is storytelling. So the same thing might apply to them, which is that a series of sounds isn't just a language, but it's a story in a way that is very un... It's very non, uh, what would be basic. I mean, you know, we use language for explaining things, for saying simple things. Obviously, there's the art in language of speaking in between the, you know, the words, you know, the subtext. But with music, it's all subtext. Yeah. And could it be that they that these other species are speaking in a subtextual way as well? That we're just not. We're looking for it to be very functional, and it isn't. Yeah, I think so. I mean, when you when you um, think of uh, an animal producing a, a a sound that is kind of a frequency modulated up down kind of whistly thing, right? And it can do this really short, or it can do that kind of more elaborate and long, and it and and it can be the same individual doing the similar sound under certain circumstances. And so it could be that in 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 one moment he's in a hurry to get the message across and you know maybe it's like hey there's fish over there and another time it's it's a it's a tired sound or an annoyed sound or a, a bored sound or you know there could be all sorts of annotations that that the that the conspecific knows how to interpret that we just have no idea you, what that can you tell what conspecific means for the oh the species. the an animal of the same species yeah, yeah. that swims around in a group yeah <laughs> well, now you've got me thinking about this now. For me, music is like, I think music, I think emotion. And that's the effect it has on me. It's, yeah, but why? Yeah, but why? That's what I was going to ask you. <laughs> that's, your, that's your area. I, I mean, when you score a movie, and thank you, you invited me down. It's one of those stories I like to tell where you said, Greg, do you want to come here? We're going to rec- it was Ferdinand. Mm-hmm. You were doing the soundtrack for Ferdinand. You invited me to the studio to hear it, and I thought it was going to be like, seven musicians in a room like this and, and it was you were conducting a 120 piece orchestra and it was just the string version and you said yeah the, the brass is we're doing that tomorrow and you had three screens with the movie showing and the musicians would watch the movie and then he would you would conduct your own composition the thing about music now where we are is it's it's a learned thing so this is what is hard to unpick from the history of music is we have learned what these things mean as a society. So we, we've learned what frightening music is, and we've learned what remote, romantic music is. And it changes each era, oh. each year, because somebody does a piece of music that's maybe a little unusually... It's not quite what you expect, but and yet it works romantically for people. Now that suddenly becomes now a new sort of device that we all know of as of being able to emote romantically because we all have so it's it's all connectional there's no music exists today that hasn't doesn't have a strand going right back to the very beginning of time in some way or other obviously uh, the history of music is kind of built in you know as Jared Diamond would be very specific about this it's it's built because of the success of certain civilizations and you can look at African music and how it's much more limited to rhythms, but highly complex in rhythms, beyond what we are able to do in the West, until recently with computers. Um, and, uh, and Asia has a different type of importance of certain of the parts of music. In the West, I think because of religion, because of Christianity and, and architecture, you ended up with music that became harmonically very complex. And that's when it's really blossomed into this kind of world where you can see how our ability to be able to see the the incredible comp- complexity of harmonics rubbing against each other within one tone and another and the tension or release within that is essentially what's inside almost all music nowadays for us um, you can do it implied and so you can do it with a single line so that birds would do that in a way if you, you know if you take a melody it implies a harmonic structure of how these things will run against each other, how where they'll push the frequencies that will rub, and then they will resolve and rub and rub. So it's kind of a binary. I've tried to break music down to a binary function, which is: is it in or is it out? 
Is it on or is it off? And but you look at that as in a micro way that it, the macro is is millions of those make the the macro. But even then, if you start to look at modern, you know, contemporary sort of music from the last hundred years, you have symphonic form where even those macros of what that's doing is are built on top of each other and on more. More of it is laid on top of each other until you have stories upon stories upon stories. Mm. If you get right back down to it, it's a question of, is that harmonic in or is it out? And if the question is, if it's out, how long will it be out until it's in again? When and you say in and out, you mean in terms of popularity? Or, no, oh. no, no, no. Literally just the physics of how, the si if you think of music as a sine wave, yeah. will the harmonics line up or do they line up or do they not line up? And if they don't, then you've got this kind of rub. Or oh, dissonant. You've got a dissonance, yeah. yeah. So it's consonance and dissonance, oh, I basically, see what you mean, yeah. at a very basic level. And, but millions of them are happening I simultaneously. Understand. And our brain's ability to be able to actually make sense of this, what other possible function could this be for? Our vowels function on, on harmonics. Tell me about vowels being on harmonics. You mean... The the they so sweep through different harmonics. You have they? your your base um, fundamental frequency that you're producing your your um, sound. Yeah. And then dependent on on the shape of um, how you shape your mouth, certain harmonics are going to come through, and that's our vowels that are being. So they're by that har way. Har harmonic to me means an even frequency jump. Correct, yeah. I mean, if, you, if you just sing, yeah. that's got a fundamental bit. If I open my mouth, you'll hear all the partials. Right. Wow. Oh, it's the same I note. See. It's see. just got that fundamental, and then it's got the octave and the fifth, and, and the octave and, and the third, and the seventh. And certain vowels that we interpret as vowels have specific harmonics <laughs> that are in the foreground. John, you said two things that are really interesting to me. One was um, this idea of conflict and resolution, conflict and resolution. In, in music, and I, I never thought about music that way, but I, I do know from writers that that's what they're always doing, in, especially in uh, movies and TV productions. They're always looking for creating a conflict and resolving it, creating a conflict and resolving it. And to hear it happening in, in music is, is, uh, is fascinating to me, and I kind of get it. And then the other thing you said was that our reaction as a society to music is, is relational to what we've been told it should be. It, now, I want to stop on that one for a second. Do you mean, like, let's just say the Jaws music? Yeah. Now, anybody that hears that, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, you know, they get scared, right? So we were trained, or is that natural? It's not a naturally menacing, because I, I, I would argue, I would think, I'm not going to argue it because I'm not capable of it, but I thought that music had some innate emotional reaction to our nervous system. Such it, it, that I think it does. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing is that those two notes together are dissonant. They are? Yeah, okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Yes. The, oh. One note and then the Can next Can you play note. it on the piano? Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, you, what you're saying musically is... You do it back two, a few times. So, Let's get everybody scared. So we all know. Yeah. So, I mean, John Williams would have to get, yeah. get, get be credited on this. We might have to pay some... some but, but the question is that before he did that, there are other examples of that. You know, Night in the Bear Mountain uh, by Mussorgsky. Um, and he, it's, it's right at the beginning of, of um, one of the scenes of that, which was programmatic music. In other words, it was descriptive music of, of, a, of a, a very kind of dark scene. Um, and so all you know is that, so if you take that note, so that's kind of all nicely in harmony, and if yeah. you did it, that's all nicely in harmony. But if you did them all at the same time. Oh, it gives you the creeps, yeah. It's two sets of harmonic things that are as close as we in the West get, which is a semitone. There are other societies that have more more gaps between the octaves, but within those two sets of parameters, they none of them line up. Absolutely none of them. I mean, you can get you can get a fifth there, and that kind of lines up. But even that fifth is already doing a ninth. Yeah. You know, so you you end up, and it sort of starts to get tenser and tenser as you go up. 
Um, but obviously, if you then get to the seventh, you know. I like that. And so you, you, yeah. you the fourth, and, and then if you did the, the the devil's interval, which is the tritone, which it was called that in the you know in the fourteenth century because it was kind of I, I've never really got to the bottom of it. It's either because it doesn't. It, it's it's a bad harmonic technique when you're yeah. composing, or it's because I don't know. It's hard to sing, <laughs> but uh, you know. So, but if you think about it, Bernstein turned it to one of the great r romantic tunes of all time. Oh, yeah. What is that song? I know it. I know it. It makes me feel good. See, that That's is Maria. 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 Maria, right, Maria. But, yeah. Okay, so you, then you ask the question, is what is going on there? So he's taking something that we thought we should never do, which is a tritone. It's, it's just a technical term for that, yeah. that interview. But where, is it, where does it really want to go? What does our brain tell us? And, is, and the question is, does it tell us that it should go up? Which is what he does. So he goes from tension to release. Right. And then that's linked into a story of West Side Story, we know that. Yeah. But it's also linked into the fact that in our lives, that means something to us, I think. It's just, um, I, you know, you know, death, life, you know. Yeah. Um, she doesn't love me. She does. Maybe she does love me. <laughs> um, I'm hungry. <laughs> I've just eaten, thank you very much. You can, you can really get it down to some real basics. But it is just a set of harmonics. It's mm. like, if you look at the math of what music is, we, I don't think anybody would be capable of working out the math constantly. But yet we are. That's what I'm saying, is that how do we get this function? Yeah. Where do we get it from? And why is it there? And why don't we use it in any other way other than enjoying music? I mean, I know we do. And, it, and obviously the link between music and language is, is, is huge. But there's another side of it that I think is beyond the functional side of language that we've never really kind of asked or found a question, which is, and the only one I can find is storytelling mm. in my head, which is beyond film, before film. You know, if I listen to a Sibelius symphony, it tells me a story. You know, maybe he was basing it on a book. Yeah. But I would never know what the book is or what his specific story. I find my own stories in it, and that's the macro of it. And the micro is, the, you know, just how the, the, how the fundamentals, the partials line up and give us either tension or release. The great John Powell, thank you for that dissertation. On, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I mean, no, it was, it was really fascinating to me. And I think it, it, it's, it's the way we need to think about some of these trans taxa questions because we get stuck in our human-centric way of talking, communicating, thinking, and then we tend to project it onto the animals around us. And... Um, I think if we're ever going to make progress on understanding the acoustics of dolphins and whales in the ocean, we have to erase the way we see the world and start to think in these, these, these other ways. That, what comes to mind um, from the animal side would be all the different species of baleen whale that have their song. And song in, in baleen whale is not a stable thing. For one, there's geographic differences that in different areas of the world the song is different. And so from that you already kind of know who's interacting within a group and who's kind of outside of the group. So then the song is stable for a certain time period. But then from, from one to year to the next it can uh, shift quite dramatically. And that is the case for for most um, baleen whales, that, that, that song evolves over time. And, and the question is why, right? I mean, so they could be singing the same thing over and over and over again. It, it might serve well, the same purpose. That's a, that's a perfect segue for our next s sequence here. But uh, thank you, uh, Simone and John, and we're going to continue after uh, the break.